Jeanette Rankin was an amazing woman. Jeanette Rankin was the first woman in Congress. She voted twice against the war, World War I and World War II, I believe. She's from Missoula, and she was a big advocate of peace. She said no on the war. She was against both World War I and World War II. After she voted against World War I, she didn't go back into the Senate for like, something like 20 years. And then uh, again, she went back and strongly opposed World War II. She was very well known, very well liked, until she voted against war. Anybody who's talking about war and the conflict over whether to go to war or not is going to talk about Jeanette Rankin, because she's the only person in United States history who voted against both world wars. It takes a lot of courage, and it's just, I, I admire her for that courage, I respect her for it. It takes a lot of heart to stand, stand up in front of the entire nation and say, this is what I believe, I don't think it's right. Montanans are tied subtly and deeply to the nation and the world. Federal politics have affected the daily lives of Native Americans, students needing loans, senior citizens seeking medical prescriptions, and ranchers leasing lands. International markets affect everything from crop selection to beef production to timber prices in Montana. Montanans have defended their country in global crises from the Spanish-American War to the conflict in Iraq. We fight for what we believe in. Look, for instance, at Montanans Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress. An acknowledged pacifist, Ms. Rankin voted against U.S. involvement in both World War I and World War II. Her stand incurred the wrath of millions of Americans, including many, but not all, Montanans. Jeanette Rankin reflects our toughness, our courage, and our integrity. She is especially a Montana story. Jeanette Rankin was a young woman, uh, born in Montana, born outside of Missoula, 1880, educated at the University of Montana, as were her five sisters, just remarkable for that turn of the century time period. I think she's remembered also as being a pacifist, one who was against war and really has spent most of her life working for peace and not war. She also was a feminist. She was a very strong advocate for women's rights because she believed that women were very different from men. She was a human being with her faults and her strengths, and she was a woman also uh, with a good sense of humor. She loved jokes. Uh, she could tell a joke. At times she got pretty earthy. Uh, she wasn't uh, by any means prim or proper. Uh, she'd been through too many battles to um, be put on a pedestal. She grew up in Missoula, Montana. Her father was a pioneer. He came to Montana as an uneducated carpenter in about 1869. And in Missoula, he was a builder, built bridges, built mansions, built business buildings. Uh, he ran the first sawmill in Missoula, provided the wood for Fort Missoula, all the timber for Fort Missoula. The Rankins had one son and five daughters. Uh, Jeanette was the oldest child. Uh, she had um, a brother, Wellington, who um, was the uh, star of the family in many ways. Uh, Jeanette Rankin's mother was uh, 
probably the second teacher in Missoula, Olive Pickering. Jeanette uh, worked on the ranch, uh, just like a, a boy would have worked on the ranch. She inherited a part of, of her personality definitely more from her father, who was a man who was a scrapper, who liked to fight. He enjoyed fighting. Jeanette liked to fight too. She was stubborn. But she also then, I think, got from her mother a sensitivity for people who were down and out, who didn't have much. And so she had compassion for the downtrodden, the poor, and certainly for women and for children. She taught for a while. Um, that didn't enthuse her. She had some very formative experiences. Uh, she went to the uh, New York School of Philanthropy and trained as a social worker. It was a very formative experience in her young adult life. Uh, she became exposed to ideas that she hadn't heard of, read, uh, seen in Montana, and it really um, energized her. It showed her what was possible. She tried social work for a while, and while that was good work for her, it wasn't what she was after. And she finally settled when she was in Washington State on the suffrage movement. Her and the suffrage leaders at the time, they were from the upper middle class. And that gave them the freedom to take on causes and to work for them. And the suffrage movement gave her a tremendous opportunity to develop her um, abilities, uh, interacting with people, speaking, um, convincing them of, a, of her argument and then came back to Montana in 1911 to what evolves pretty quickly into heading up the Montana suffrage movement to get the vote for women. She was very sensitive and attuned politically to the fact that if they did not have the support of those with less fortune, uh, they would never go any place. For the women to get the vote in Montana, males are gonna have to vote for it. And I think the men who came to the West uh, were independent. And so they just recognized some qualities of women that if they could work in the fields, well, why shouldn't they have the right to vote? The fact that she's young and attractive and active and appealing uh, has a lot to do with that. Uh, she, she stumps the entire state, talks to the legislature on different uh, occasions. Wyoming was the first state to grant women the right to vote and Washington and Oregon and, and the more western states were the leaders in granting women the right to vote before it was passed nationally. I think that's something to do with the spirit of the West. And in 1914, women get the vote in Montana. The first election they can vote in is 1916. very close to her brother. He was probably the most important male uh, figure in her life. He gave her political advice, uh, gave her financial support, took care of her legal business. He was a lawyer. Uh, he, he's a big player all the way through. And uh, so he talks Jeanette into running for Congress. Circumstances all come together to elect her. The fact that it's a statewide vote is very beneficial to her. She can get votes from the homestead men in eastern Montana who are being lobbied heavily by their wives. She's not fighting the miners in Butte or the lumbermen in northwest Montana the way she might. When she arrived in Washington in the spring of 1917, after having been elected in November of 1916, she arrives and the first thing she is asked to do is to vote on uh, going to war. You'd think they could have warmed her up on a couple fiscal bills or something first, um, but her very first recorded vote is on do we enter World War I. It was not an easy decision. She did not enter the city knowing how she would vote on that. And on the second ballot, she rose to her feet and said, I want to stand by my country, but I cannot vote for war. I vote no. While the national press devoted an enormous amount of attention to Rankin's vote, she had not stood alone. Fifty-five other members of Congress also voted no. Hundreds of Montanans wrote to their Jeanette. This is what they called her oftentimes in their letters. And I must say a few words about this correspondence. 
Now these letters are overwhelmingly from women. Many wrote immediately afterwards, praising her or vilifying her. She says later that that vote is the pivotal action in her life. Uh, the one thing that uh, we have not done in our civilization is we have not sought other ways to solve disputes. And she felt that there needed to be more uh, preventing measures than going to war. And she said war never solved anything. It creates more problems. Jeanette was an idealist thinking that if, especially on the issue of war, that if women got the right to vote and served in Congress and uh, especially, that they would vote against war. But she could not bring herself to vote in sending young boys to war to be killed. She could not bring herself to be the first woman to vote for war. She was able to repair her, her war vote. She voted for financing the war and other matters uh, under Wellington's strong recommendation. She said, you've got to fix this, and she did. Um, he, he wasn't able to change her mistakes relative to um, Butte. When the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, the miners were pushed to produce minerals for arms supplies. Because Butte mining was important to the war effort, many people came to protest America's involvement in the war. Frank Little was one of them. He was the chairman of the board of the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies. In the early morning of August 1, 1917, six masked men kidnapped Little from a boarding house, violently killed him, and hung him from a railroad trestle with the words of warning if others should speak up against the company. Little's murder drew reaction from prominent politicians. Jeanette quickly spoke out against the company. I think I know perfectly well what Anaconda will try to do to me. They'll try to do to me just what they have done to everyone who ever tried to oppose them. They own the state, they own the government, they own the press. First I'll be pasted from one end of the state to the other. Every newspaper will print my shortcomings, real or fancied in the largest type. All the mud and all the bricks in the state will come hurtling in my direction. In, in 1918 when she left Congress, the Helena newspaper said she has a brilliant future behind her. She tries to run again in 1918, she's, be, she's defeated um, and, and more or less withdraws from politics. During the 20s and 30s, she works as a kind of a grassroots organizer for a number of peace organizations, national. She moves to Georgia, um, uh, gets a dirt farm in Georgia outside of Athens because it's closer to Washington, D.C and she, she has good access to congressional committees that way. In the late 30s, Wellington convinces her to run again for Congress. That decision she makes, not because she thinks she's going to win, but because she thinks the campaign platform will give me a way to get my peace message across. It'll let me broadcast my peace message. And lo and behold, there's a strong peace sentiment in Montana in 1939, 1940. So she's elected again. And when the vote comes around December 8th, 1941, uh, she is the only one who votes against our entry into World War II. Is chastised by practically everyone. Um, and, and it becomes practically ineffective for, for the last year of her, of her term. Um, no way she's going to get reelected. After she left Congress, Jeanette shifted her focus to other countries. She remained active in the peace movement as a pacifist resurfacing during the Vietnam War. In 1973, at the age of 92, Jeanette Rankin passed away in California, 30 years after leaving Congress. When I talk to kids about Jeanette, uh, the thing that is most compelling, I think, about her is that she's so committed. She had at least two opportunities where she, she could have voted yes on, on both wars and gone right along. But her convictions told her to vote otherwise. The image I try to use with kids is, is that Jeanette's um, 
commitment to peace is, is a straight line, and time winds, you know, public opinion winds back and forth, first one way and then the other. And there were three places where those lines crossed. One was in 1718, um, when she was elected to Congress. The next one was in 4041, when she's elected to Congress. And then the third one is the 68 to 70 period, when, when the anti-Vietnam War uh, protests come. Um, and she stays the same. You know, it's, it's public opinion that comes and goes um, and, and grasps her when they need her. She certainly was there for women and children. Jeanette was always for the young. And that's what, one of the things which saddened her deeply about war. She said, how many Michelangelos, how many authors, how many artists, musicians, statesmen uh, were killed? in war, needles. Uh, but she said one time, one of the more tiring things about growing old is having to fight some of the same battles over and over again. She would be fighting the same battle against war were she living today.